Hey, good morning. Welcome to our e-service for the 19th of July, 2020, the year that we had to physically distance in the summer. Uh, <laughs> just a couple of announcements for you this morning. Uh, as always, if you will check your email and if you don't get it, you know, if you don't get the emails, if you got here by some other venue, or if you're not an email user, let's touch base. Let's see what we can do to keep you in the loop. Second thing, if you participated in any way, contributed financially, joined the virtual walk, either here or uh, elsewhere, for the Lust Garden Pancreatic Cancer Research Fundraiser that Joan organized, facilitated once again this year, thank you. Thank you to Joan. Thank you to all of you participated or contributed in any way. As you know, pancreatic cancer is a uh, notorious sort of cancer that's touched the lives of several people in this congregation, and it's the sort of thing where they can use all the help they can get, so very much appreciated. Uh, third, and, and finally, if you haven't yet talked to me about the garden, if you're not on the text list, and if you're, well, whatever, if you, if you happen to have not talked about it this year. Just know that we're getting to that point. It's starting to bear fruit. It's going to start needing attention on the little more regular because of uh, gathering vegetables, picking vegetables, and delivering them. Uh, and we've got a few people, of course, who have been tending to these sorts of things so far, uh, but the many hands make light work, and it's a good ministry that we can still do during this time. Very good for a couple of reasons. You know, First of all, it's outside in small groups, keeping distance. It's a, it's a <laughs> pandemic-friendly ministry. On top of that, food banks and food pantries have been hit really hard by the current circumstances. So uh, any help we can give them in this way is also uh, much appreciated. So if you're interested in that, let me know somehow. You can even just leave a note right here. Leave it in the comments, you know, just give me, just put your name, uh, you don't even have to put your last name or your number, I'll figure it out. But if, you, if you're interested in helping, let me know. Okay, uh, I think that's it. So let's get started. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Skies, my heart awaking cries. May Jesus Christ be praised. I like at work and prayer. To Jesus I repair. May Jesus Christ be praised. The sacred bell it feels for hill and dell 
may Jesus Christ be praised. Oh, hark to what it sings, as joyously it rings. May Jesus Christ be praised. In heaven's eternal bliss, the loveliest strain is this. May Jesus Christ be praised. Let air and sea and sky from depths to heights reply. May Jesus Christ be praised. Be this while life is mine, my canticle divine. May Jesus Christ be praised. Be this the eternal song through all the ages on. May Jesus Christ be The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Faithful God, most merciful judge, you care for your children with firmness and compassion. By your spirit, nurture us who live in your kingdom, that we may be rooted in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our gospel reading for today, continuing in the 13th chapter of Matthew, we begin today at the 24th verse. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evil doers. And they will throw them into the furnaces of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers in Christ. And hey, if you got deja vu there a minute ago while I was reading that, I wouldn't be surprised because I sure did. Like I said, we're in the same chapter uh, of Matthew, but that's not all that's the same. Jesus is still teaching about the state of things through the use of parable. Specifically, we've got another parable about food, the growth of food. Uh, you know, I could almost repeat myself verbatim because there's a few things that are so similar. We've got a form of farming as the object lesson. I mentioned that I can't speak to farming all that well. Uh, there's enough different from Jesus' day to today that we might actually get tripped up if we think too much in modern terms, right? And there's a strong tendency, just like last week, to hear a parable like this and go straight to the, the moral of the story, what you ought to do. Well, 
Uh, let's unpack those last two. It won't be exactly the same, of course. You can think about your relationship with weeds. What does weed even mean? And there's a definition that fits Jesus' day and today pretty well, and, uh, as long as we keep it simple. Something like a plant that isn't where you want it to be, or it's where you don't want it to be. You know, maybe that in modern terms, you'd think of it as consuming too many nutrients, too much water. It disrupts the growth of other plants, like the plants you do want there. Sometimes it's just you don't like the look of it. And I suppose there's a whole other definition of weed that <laughs> your mind could have gone to, but this ain't it. Uh, instead, thinking of more specific plants like that, Jesus is, well, some scholars figure he's talking about a very particular weed from his day. And it was particularly obnoxious because it looked so much like wheat. It would grow with it. Like the situation he's describing is one apparently they were familiar with because this weed would grow up. And by the time you could tell it wasn't wheat, it was too late. Tearing it out, even carefully by hand, might mean ripping the roots out of the wheat. So again, if we don't get too much into what the modern, how we handle weeds in the modern day, we can keep it simple. Plant somewhere we don't want it to be, the garden, the field, whatever and we tolerate it to various degrees, then it fits. So no, no big problem there. Now the second possibility, which for my taste happens too often, is going straight to the moral of the story here. What is it Jesus wants you to do? <laughs> How, what would Jesus do? How should you improve your life? Because with a parable like this, it can open up a whole can of worms. Who is the wheat? Who is the weed? Can weeds ever do good? In this life, can I be both weed and wheat? Is it whether I'm one or the other by the time I die? Uh, given too much emphasis, a parable like this meant to teach about a few things over here could slip into some pro troublesome problems over there. It would not be wise at this point to try to figure out who was placed here by the devil right? Humans have enough trouble getting along. We're really good at dividing ourselves into tribes and clans and camps. We don't need a parable like this to encourage us to do it any more than we already do, especially when it might imply that some people are irredeemable. Okay, so that's a long-winded way of saying it. it's kind of similar to last week, kind of not. How we approach this text, um, we got to be a little careful because some ways are more helpful than others. But let's back it up. Another way that I really like to, I often do, you know, let's consider the Matthew as a whole, how Matthew uses these unique parables to talk about the end times and judgment day, records Jesus' parables, I should say, more than any other gospel writer. He's concerned with how the good and the bad will turn out when Jesus comes back to judge the world. Add to that, uh, Matthew's got a particular eye on the church. We can pretty safely assume Matthew is dealing with a community that has some wolves in sheep's clothing. There are people pretending to be Christians who are not. And this is quite early in the life of the church, so there's a chance Matthew is responding to the very first time someone claimed the name of Christ because it was socially advantageous, not because they believed it, not because they were committed. Now that happens all the time nowadays in our culture, so maybe we should note how Matthew deals with it. Now, this is not a guarantee, but we can get some insight by approaching this parable, uh, assuming it fits the pattern of Matthew, right? It's because it's unique to Matthew. It talks about Jesus returning and judging everyone into one group or the other. The field is left ambiguous. Maybe it's the world, maybe it's the church. Accounting for that, then, this becomes a parable about theodicy. Now, that's a fancy pants church word, but you've probably heard uh, well, I know you've heard it because I've said it so many times. The Odyssey literally means justifying God, but more practically, it means accounting for evil in the world. So how do we explain? How does a good God with a good creation, how is there so much suffering in that creation? Why do bad things happen to good people? Or for today's parable, why are there so many jerks in the world? Well, I'm going to stick with the already mentioned uh, considerations of reading this a certain way and suggest that Jesus isn't being so literal as to suggest that the devil made certain people and now we've got like a like a Jesus's team versus the devil's team sort of thing and that's not that's not quite what it is rather Jesus is using this it's an allegory of sorts to hit on the basics of Christianity 
as it pertains to these questions of evil specifically, seeing that there are evil doers in the world, why doesn't God stop them? The first answer is the mystery that predates Jesus. It's found throughout the Old Testament in various accounts that evil and chaos came from somewhere to this place. We're never exactly told where or why, but it's left to stay for some purpose. God knows it's here and leaves it. In the parable, the intruder purposefully plants these seeds of weeds. No given reason. Who would do that? All we know is he and his seeds came from somewhere else. They don't belong here. The second answer then is that God doesn't root out the evil because, well, let's say it's people, actions, consequences, because the damage of rooting it out would damage would be damaged for the good people too. The people whom God will one day bring into this eternal bliss are, in a strange sense, protected by leaving the evil for a while. Now, different Christians may plug in why that is to different answers, but I would answer the an answer, I would give an answer that's compatible with, I would say, most of Christian theology, and it goes something like this. Again, you've heard this before. God is inherently and eternally relational. God relates within the Trinity and seeks relationship outside it. In order to maintain genuine relationship, that means things like love, respect, wanting to be there, even some other things, maybe fear. To have a relationship like that, there has to be an alternative. We can't even imagine taking a painting or a robot and having a real relationship with it. And neither can God. The possibility of relationship demands the possibility of no relationship. It means choice, free agency, free will. It means chaos. It means things can go well or they can go poorly. With an end goal in mind of having a relationship with, let's just say, innumerable independent agents like humans, other things in creation perhaps, God sets creation in motion and intercedes in one way or another to put us humans here. We therefore live in a world that has chaos and choice and evil so that we can have genuine relationship, including relationship with God. When the time comes, God will remove these things. They were once necessary impediments in our relating to one another and thriving and surviving. And we'll be left with a world that's free of sin, death, the devil, suffering, chaos, disaster, the whole bit. Now you can call that a greater good if you would like. I prefer maybe God's self-limits for the sake of relationship. There's a couple other ways we could come at that question and answer. But the point is simply this. You cannot love and be loved by God within the confines of a relationship unless it's possible for you to choose not to. The power of choice brings in certain kinds of evil. The start that this parable addresses. Where does it fit then? We're in the in-between time. Uprooting evil too soon, like right then or right now, would disrupt the purpose of this creation. It would cease to allow for it would even stop the production, you might say, of agents with which God can have genuine relationship. And we, even those who have already been here, would suffer for the loss. Its purpose, creation's purpose, is still in motion. Wheat is still springing forth. The yield is still increasing the longer we're here. So it would be reckless for God to harvest it all now and just be done with it. It's, in fact, better for us that God wait. So then... Did you hear this text telling you, watch out, beware you're not a weed. <laughs> Be sure you're bearing some fruit. If you did, sure, like last week, maybe your conscience or God is pulling you in that way. But in a day like today, it's only natural. You know, we can't hardly do most of the things we would like to do, especially the things that help other people. So I'm pretty sure that's not the word for today. I, I don't think that's the word Jesus has for you, at least. Instead, the troubles of this world, injustice, disease, chaos, and death, we're looking at them all the time, and they stink. They stink. They're bad <laughs> for us and for God, and yet the benefit of them is inconceivable. In the Romans text for today, which I skipped, I'm actually going to catch up to it uh, for next week, Paul says we can't compare the sufferings of this era with the rewards that wait in the next now, that doesn't mean we minimize the suffering like it's no big deal. We don't sit on our hands and do nothing either. We don't pretend because God's got our back that we should live selfishly and just do whatever we want to be happy. None of that. No, we just take the assurance 
That this field, be it God's church, God's world, this age that we live in, whatever it is, that it will come to an end when its purpose is met. And it will have been worth it. We just have to have waited a little longer. We just will have had to have waited a little longer. Amen. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. With that, I ask you to join me in confessing the faith of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of the harvest, you sow good seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ into your field. Help your church throughout the world to be both diligent and patient, full of resolve and gentleness, that our witness may be faithful to your intentions. Lord, in your mercy. God of all space and time, your whole creation groans in labor pains, awaiting for the gift of new birth. Renew the earth, sky, and sea so that all your creation experiences freedom from the bondage of decay. Lord, in your mercy. God of the nations, teach us your ways that we may walk in your truth. Mend the fabric of the human family now torn apart by fearful and warring ways. And we pray that you would be with those who may be in harm's way as they struggle and strive for peace.
and justice. We pray that you be with John, Josh, Tyler, Jack, Robert, Matt, Nick, Morgan, and Dane. Lord, in your mercy. God of hope, you accompany those who suffer and are near to the brokenhearted. Open our hearts to your children who are lonely and abandoned, who feel trapped by despair, and all who suffer in any way. We pray for Jerry, Joe, and Jim, for Rob and Linda and Gary, for John, Gail, and Lisa, for Joni, Larry, Cindy, John, and Melody, for Grace, Danny, and Stephanie, for Bailey, Connie, and Kendall, for Val, Jean, and Horst, for Barbara, Richard, Serenata, Anne, and Larry, for Carol, Jean, Elizabeth, Mary, and Jean, for Edie, Mary, Frank, Joyce, and Leona, for Amy, Dean, Andrea, Dennis, Ida, Mabel, and Doug. Lord, in your mercy. God of the seasons, in the midst of summer, give us refreshment, renewal, and new opportunities. We pray for the safety of those who travel. We pray for those who cannot take the rest they need. And we pray for those who uh, continue to work on the metaphorical front lines of the pandemic. Lord, in your mercy. God of life, those who have died in you shine like the sun in your endless kingdom. We remember with thanksgiving the saints of all times and places and saints close to us. We remember again, especially Iva Bartel. We pray that you be with her family, give them comfort and peace, and gather us with her and all the rest on the day of salvation. Lord, in your mercy. It's in the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, that we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Uh, just go ahead and take a moment, if you'd like, to share a, a, a greeting in the chat box. <laughs> Comments, text messages, whatever you'd like to do. I have to say, I've been... Um, give you a little insight behind the curtain, and I don't know how this will work when we get to a more transitional period, but I've been kind of managing the ability to call in. It's the same software platform we're using for our virtual meetings and for virtual coffee hour. People can call in who don't have access to the internet, don't have a computer at home, for example, uh, to hear the service if they should so choose. And that requires a little bit of manual intervention. I've I've thought of some ways to maybe minimize that, oh, maybe pursue that, but as it is for the moment, that's why I've not been in the chat box personally. So uh, right now, if you're sending messages, I may not even be seeing them, and that's kind of a sad thought, but each other, you can see each other's messages. So I hope you're having a peaceful week and you're staying safe and what have you. With that, as a reminder, uh, offerings are still coming in, mostly by mail, mostly directly to the financial secretary. Uh, with that in mind, we'll pray over uh, all of the gifts that have been given and received over to God. Now, let us pray. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Nourish us with your gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. With that, as you go safely and responsively into your home, please know that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.
hey, if you stuck around, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I sure do appreciate you connecting in this way. I know others do as well. It's been a difficult, long road, um, but we're going to get through it. This is just a, a temporary, temporary setback. So however it's going, however you're doing, I hope to connect with you again one way or another real soon.